Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study, our book of Jeremiah, He Whom God Launches Forth. What a fantastic book, historically and in the future sense, of bringing us the Word of God, and inasmuch as God's Word is the Word, I mean, you can count on it. He gives you his emotions, the mo emotions of people, and it doesn't take long for you to learn what God loves. There was a, a little Gentile Ethiopian came up to the king and said, hey, you're not doing Jeremiah right. He's done in that well and he's going to die. And the king commissioned him to go save Jeremiah, to lift him out of the well. God never forgets when someone helps his servants. He never forgets. That's what we open with today. That um, Ethiopian being Ebedmelech, the king's servant. Uh, so with that having been said, with... Um, Nebuchadnezzar now having taken care of Zedekiah and his sons, we are in the closing moments of that. But then God intercedes again for a special reason. Listen to it. Chapter 39, verse 15, that word of wisdom from our Father, and it reads, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah, while he was shut up in the court of the prison, saying, while he was still there, listen to me, 16, go and speak to Ebedmelech, the Ethiopian, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring my words upon this city for evil and not for good, and they shall be accomplished in that day before thee. You're, you're going to see it come to pass. You're going to be there. Verse 17, but I will deliver thee in that day, saith the Lord, and thou shalt not be given into the hand of the men of whom thou art afraid. God always remembers and God always protects. This is payback for Ebedmelech, for his good service to Jeremiah, that God always takes care of those that help his servants. God always takes care of the family that serves the living God. God always protects the family that listens to God and that hears God with understanding. So here, here this um, Ebedmelech, a, an Ethiopian, a Gentile, helping Jeremiah, God reaches down and touches him. Next verse to complete the chapter, verse 18. For I will surely deliver thee, and thou shalt not fall by the sword, but thy life shall be for a prey unto thee, a gift. Your life's going to be your gift, because, now here you can learn something, because of what? Because thou hast put thy trust in me, saith the Lord. This Ethiopian trusted the living God. Do you see what difference it makes? You see, you can't con our Father. He knows who trusts him and who doesn't. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I've reported and repeated Jeremiah ch chapter 17, verse 5, so many times I'm almost ashamed to bring it up again. But here, he trusted God. What did it say back there? It said, Cursed is the man that puts his trust in man in flesh instead of God. It's, it, that's pretty simple, isn't it? Well, it's, that has not changed. It's the same today, and it shall be always. You can always trust our Heavenly Father. He takes care of those that are the family of His election that bring to pass the things that God states and is helpful in accomplishing those deeds 
Father has eyes to see, certainly, and ears to hear, inasmuch as he planned everything. So, really, what was it? Because thou hast put thy trust in me, you're not going to die. Something, because you put your trust in him today, into our heavenly Father, you have gained eternal life. You're never going to taste death spiritually. Chapter 40, verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord after that Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, had let him go from Ramah when he had taken him being bound in chains among all that were carried away captives of Jerusalem and Judah, which were carried away captive unto Babylon. Now, you can see in this, um, um, this captain of Nebuchadnezzar's knew. I mean, Jeremiah was in prison. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar is going to turn him loose. Why? Well, listen, let him, let him explain himself. Verse 2, And the captain of the guard told Jeremiah and said unto him, the Lord thy God hath pronounced this evil upon this place. This is a Babylonian stating this. Not only a Gentile, but a Babylonian. Verse 3. Now, and he continues. Now the Lord hath brought it and done according as he hath said. Because ye have sinned against the Lord. And have not obeyed his voice, therefore... This thing has come upon you. That is, that is a, a remarkable thing. That the very enemy of the house of Israel, you could say enemy, but didn't, were they truly an enemy in as much as they were servants of the living God? And God swore, you go with them. It is for your own protection. It is to serve a purpose. It is the same way in the end times when you're delivered up before the false messiah. You go. Your own family will, will um, deliver you there, begging mercy for you because they will think it is Christ. And you will go and you will perform what God has to will tell you at that time, not premeditating what you will say beforehand. Verse 4. And now, behold, the, the Babylonian continues... And now, behold, I loose thee this day from the chains which were upon thine hand. If it seem good unto thee to come with me into Babylon, come, and I will look well unto thee. I'll, I'll see that you're well taken care of. But if it seem ill unto thee to come with me into Babylon, forbear. Don't, don't do it. Um, Behold, all the land is before thee, whether it seemeth good and convenient for thee to go thither, go. Whatever seems good to you, or however God leads you, that's where you go. And naturally, that's where Jeremiah would go anyway. But is it, is it not amazing that those last three verses spoken by a Babylonian has God's hand all over it? God uses whomever, you've got to get that in your mind. God will use whomever he chooses. Verse 5, And while he was not yet gone back, he said, Go back also to Gedaliah, the son of Hikam, the son of Shaphan, whom the king of Babylon hath made governor over the cities. And... Um, he was a common man, you understand? All the king line are gone the, of Judah and dwell with him among the people or go wheresoever it seemeth convenient unto thee to go. So the captain of the guard gave him victuals and a reward and let him go. And, and here it is, God seeing to it. I mean, leaving him the open choice. You follow me, hey, I'm going to say you're in good shape. You go wherever you want to. Gedaliah was a commoner, but he was loyal to, to stay, to, to, as God would say. Uh, if you follow the orders of Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to stay. You're going to have fields to, to produce fruit for you. You're going to be in good shape. So 
here Gedaliah is put in charge because he was a good old boy. And, and the enemy knew that and could trust him. They, they'd put Zedekiah in charge, who was of the royal seed. What did he do? He went bad. Leaned on Pharaoh, tried to defeat uh, Nebuchadnezzar through Pharaoh with Pharaoh's help. And um, he, he was just not to be trusted. You could not trust him. But they trusted Gedaliah. He was, he was a good old boy, and he could get it done. Verse 6. Then went Jeremiah unto Gedaliah, the son of Hikam, to Mizpah. Mizpah means the watchtower, place to watch. And dealt, dwelt with him among the people that were left in the land. He'd be about four miles out of Jerusalem. It's very close to the place where the deed was buried that we had forementioned. Verse 7, now listen carefully. Don't, let, don't read over what's about to be said. Now when all the captains of the forces which were in the fields, and they and their men heard that the king of Babylon had made Gedaliah the son of Ahikam governor in the land and had committed unto him men, women, and children of the poor, that's to say of the humble of the land. The humble inherit the earth. The meek inherit the earth, okay? Of them that were not carried away captive to Babylon. Now, you know, when you deal with people... And what has just happened here? There's been a war. The armies that were protecting Jerusalem should have been protecting it. So what are these captains doing out in the field? They ran. They're cowards. They would not make a stand. And, and there now, they've heard out of their little, little holes in the ground that Nebuchadnezzar's troops are gone, and Galilee is in charge. He's just a commoner, good old boy. He believe anything. He's just really in love with everyone. And these people are cowards, traitors, and crooks. People have got to be sharper than a bunch of crooks. I don't care if you're the best Christian in the world, you've got to be sharper than crooks. Okay? Well, you're supposed to love everybody. That's a bunch of malarkey. God, do you think God is supposed to love everybody? He hated Esau. Malachi chapter 1, read it for yourself. Why? Because he didn't care about God or his heritage. And God loves his children enough that he will protect those that would do them ill. And don't think this bunch wouldn't do get Eliah ill. They will. So now you know what kind of people we're dealing with here. Verse 8, to continue. Then they came to get Eliah to Mizpah, even Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah. Sounds an awful lot like Nethanim, doesn't it? Given to service. And Johanan and Jonathan, the sons of Kariah, and Siriah, the son of Tanhumeth, and the sons of Ephi, the Nethrothite. These sound like Hebrew names to you? They're not. Jezaniah, that is, and the son of Maacathite, the son of a Maacathite, they and their men. So uh, we kind of got quite a little group here. Verse 9, captain of the thieves, you might say. And Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shophan, swear unto them and to their men, saying, Fear not to serve the Chaldeans. Dwell in the land and serve the king of Babylon, and it shall be well with thee, with you. Well, this would be good. Fine, that's the word of God. And, and that's what, not only is it the word of God, but it was the word of Nebuchadnezzar when he put Gedaliah in charge. He said, putting you in charge, you can live here, you take care of it, keep it up, let it produce for you, 
keep the peace. Verse 10. As for me, Gedaliah speaking, behold, I will dwell at Mizpah here at the watchtower to serve the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, which will come unto us, but ye gather you wine and summer fruits and oil and put them in your vessels and dwell in your cities that you have taken. I mean, just a good old boy, just turn it over to them. Anytime you turn everything over to a bunch of crooks, you're not all that much a good old boy kind of down, you're kind of a stupid old boy. God expects you to be able to perform some covert activities when it's necessary. He expects you to be wiser than the serpent and as peaceful as a dove. Verse 11. It's going to be a 70 years to stay, all right? And they know it. Take care of yourselves is what uh, Gedaliah is saying. 11. Likewise, when all the Jews that were in Moab and among the Amorites, and in Edom, and they were in all the countries, heard that the king of Babylon had left a remnant of Judah, and that he had set over them Gedaliah, the son of Ahiakim, the son of Shaphan. He's a commoner, and he's a pushover. Boy, we can go there, and we can do big business. And what, what they intend to do because of the ilk that is mixed up among us, they're going to kill him. That's what their wishes are. Uh, and do you think this, this will not make any points with Almighty God? It will not make any points with Nebuchadnezzar. And, but at the same time, learn who you can trust and who you should not trust. Be wiser than the serpent and never let the serpent take advantage of you because he certainly will. You know, uh, Satan's people can always talk a mean battle. Oh, it sounds so convincing. But here this good old boy is saying, hey, it's all right there for you. Just go to it. Everything you want right there. We're, we're just going to get along here. Well, unfortunately, if you don't recognize who you're dealing with, and the names really could have done it. Should have put him on guard. And I'm not knocking um, Gedaliah. It's just that um, you're supposed to learn from his experience that it doesn't happen to you. Okay, Verse 12. Even all the Jews returned out of all places. That's people that lived in Judea. Returned to all places whether they were driven, where they ran. And came to the land of Judah to... Gedaliah unto Mizpah, unto the watchtower there, and gathered wine and summer fruits very much. Boy, I mean, they harvested her. They cleaned her out. 13. Moreover, Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces that were in the fields came to Gedaliah to Mizpah. They gathered in there. Verse 14. And said unto him, Dost thou certainly know that Baalus, the king of the Amorites, hath sent Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, to slay thee? But Gedaliah, the son of Ahiakim, believed them not. Oh, no, no, I've been good to him. I'm so good, how could anybody dislike me? I'm just going to, I'm just making it so good for them. Why in the world would they want to destroy me? Because they're a bunch of crooks. Okay. They didn't, they made no stand. They will stand for nothing. Bunch of cowards. Cowards are dangerous. Okay. And, and ran. Now they come back to just rip off everything. But um, of his own father, those people, it's the, the crud that had mixed in among them, quite frankly, they won't get a lie dead so they can take over everything. They got a bad problem, though. Nebuchadnezzar's still in charge. And Gedaliah was his man. You do away with Gedaliah, he's going to be back. Nebuchadnezzar is. 
15. Then Johanan, the son of Kareah, spake to Gedaliah in Mizpah secretly, saying, Let me go, I pray thee, and I will slay Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and no man shall know it. Wherefore should he slay thee, that all the Jews, all these people in Judea, which are gathered unto thee, should be scattered, and the remnant in Judah perish? Why, why should we let him destroy us? Let me slip over there covertly. I'll simply put him out of his misery, it, it, and nobody will know difference. It, I'll make it look like an accident, perhaps, or whatever. They'll not be the wiser. Just let me do him in. But yet a lie was put here because he's a good old boy. Verse 16, But Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, said, Johanan, the son of Korea, to uh, the Korea, Thou shalt not do this thing, for thou speakest falsely of Ishmael. Couldn't see it. You know, you can be blind to the enemy, and you've got to know who the enemy is. And that's, that is very important. One that does not serve God is an enemy of God, basically, po a, a strong possibility. And you have to know that. Uh, God will never use them and certainly cannot use them. But you cannot be made the fool. At the time you think you have everything put away peacefully and reasoned with, and you've allowed a bunch of crud to come cowards is what I'm talking about, to come in out of the field where they ran and buried themselves until the danger was over, they want to take over. And um, you've got to learn that that kind of greed and power hungry is what God despises. But good old boy, no, they wouldn't bother me. I've been too good to them. And you've got to learn from the lesson. You can be too good to some people if they're bad people. You have to understand and know, be, well, what does this take? Spiritual discernment. When God gives you the gift of spiritual discernment, you don't have to hear it said. You sense spiritually trouble when it comes. God always takes care of his own. And that's why you have the gift of spiritual discernment. Gedaliah, unfortunately, was, was um, too interested in being a good leader, providing for everyone, to look out for Satan, who is still very much spiritually in this world. Verse, chapter 41, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the seventh month that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, the son of Elishama, of the seed royal, the princes of the king, even ten men with him, came unto Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, to Mizpah, and there they did eat bread together in Mizpah. Good buddies, good old buddy, buddy, break bread together. Come on, get alive. One and all here, we're good friends. He's been warned. Two times. Verse 2. Then arose Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and the ten men that were with him, and smote get alive the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, with a sword and slew him, whom the king of Babylon had made governor over the land. Verse 3. Ishmael also slew all the Jews, that's to say people living in Judea, that were with him, even with Gedaliah at Mizpah, and the Chaldeans, that's to say the Babylonians, that were found there in the men of war. They killed the Babylonians also. Boy, are they asking for it. 
Verse 4, And it came to pass the second day after he had slain Gedaliah that no man knew it. They kept it covered. Sure work covertly, huh? Verse 5, That there came certain from Shechem, from Shiloh, and from Samaria, watch mountain, even four score men, that's a bunch, having their beards shaven and their clothes rent and having cut themselves with offerings and incense in their hand to bring them to the house of the Lord. <clears throat> They're on a spiritual mission. And, and because of the captivity, they, they are uh, no doubt coming to the house of the Lord to pray for release and, and uh, God's blessings. Verse 6, And Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, went forth from Mizpah to meet them, weeping all along as he went. And it came to pass, as he met them, he said unto them, Come to Gedaliah, the son of Hycom. He's dead. I mean, here this guy is weeping like a baby, putting on a show, verse 7. And it was so when they came into the midst of the city that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, slew them and cast them into the midst of the pit, he and the men that were with him, all of them. Talk about an enemy. And... and um, does God bless such a thing as this? Of course, you know what the answer to that is. Does Nebuchadnezzar bless such a thing as this, the servant of God? Of course not. Satan will always slip in. Satan will always try to disrupt God's plan. And it was God's plan that the people go into captivity. Verse 8. But ten men were found among them that said unto Ishmael, Slay us not, for we have treasures in the field, of wheat and of barley and of oil and of honey. So he forbear and slew them not among their brethren. They bought their way out. Okay. Ten of them. Verse 9. Now the pit wherein Ishmael had cast all the dead bodies of the men whom he had slain because of Gedaliah, was it which Asa the king had made for fear of Baasha, king of Israel, and Ishmael the son of Nethaniah filled it with them that were slain. You want to remember, Asia here is of the royal seed of the house of Israel, not Judah. Okay. You want to know why the ace is the highest card in the deck? You might listen and learn. Verse 10. Then Ishmael carried away captive all the residue of the people that were in Mizpah, even the king's daughters. Here's the daughters that Jeremiah would later take. And all the people that remained in Mizpah, whom Nebuchadnezzar and the captain of the guard had committed to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, and Ishmael, the son of Nehemiah, Nehemiah rather, uh, carried them away captive and departed to go over to the Amorites. Uh, and, and so it was. He, he was not... Um, a good person at all. And our Father, using him to align up now, uh, what is taking place here. And from this, from the king and, and uh, offspring of the house of Israel and the king's daughters, the daughters of Judah, there will be salvage that will continue the line until Christ himself returns to take it for himself. Verse 11. But when Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces that were with him heard of all the evil that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, had done, verse 12, 
Then they took all the men and went to fight with Ishmael the son of Nethaniah and found him by the great waters that are in Gibeon. He came down. 13. Now it came to pass that when all the people which were with Ishmael saw Jehanan the son of Korea and all the captains of the forces that were with him then they were glad. Of course they were. They were in a heap of hurt. Bear in mind, again, within this group, we have the daughters of the king of Judah. Verse 14. So all the people that Ishmael had carried away captive from Mizpah cast about and returned and went unto Johanan, the son of Korea. And... Um, and, of course, they have no idea of what all has happened to the fullest degree. Fifteen. But Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, escaped from Johanan with eight men and went to the Amorites. And uh, with eight, two of the ten were slain. Verse 16. Then took Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces that were with him, all the remnant of the people whom he had recovered from Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, from Mishpah, after that he had slain Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, even mighty men of war, and the women and the children and the eunuchs whom he had brought, again from Gibeah, and with those women came those daughters, of course, the daughters of Zedekiah. How precious it is that God always takes care of his own. He carries that seed line forth, even though you have wickedness in the world. Good people are a wonderful treasure to Almighty God, but you've got to be sharp, you've got to be alert, you have to be able to discern evil, for there is evil in the world. And the only way you can serve God is to defeat Satan and anything evil that he might send against God's ministry or against God's family. You must always be able to recognize that. We'll pick this up in the next lecture. Bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend or denomination or organization. We're not going to judge people. We have a judge, and he can handle that part of it, okay? But you do have that spiritual discernment I forementioned. Fantastic. Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the end of the hour will give you a mailing address. Again, always a pleasure. Now, got a prayer request. You don't need the number. don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. He reads your mind. You don't even have to say it out loud. Let him know that you love him. That's what he wants primarily from you. And just talk to him. That's what prayer is. Tell him, tell him what your situation is. When you need help, 
don't, don't mind calling him. He's ready, and he wants to hear from you. Just let him know that you love him. That's the main thing. Um, he always takes care of his own. I think today's lecture with the, the um, uh, Ibed Mulek, the Ethiopian that did a good service, he repaid him. He always remembers those things. Let him know you love him. Father, around the globe we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. Uh, ben from Michigan, nine years old. Okay, does God eat manna like we will? Well, he's in, he's in spirit body, so naturally manna is spiritual food. So I'm sure that he does. Lorraine from um, Michigan, question. How do you think we will be called before Antichrist? Uh, television, will some authority pick us up and deliver unto us to them? No. R read Mark 13 over again. This is why that mother shall betray daughter to death. Satan's name is death, okay? The mother that thinks he's Jesus, She's going to go to him and say, Jesus, save my daughter. She's a little confused now, but I want you, you know, she believes it is the Lord Jesus Christ and that he will have mercy on her daughter. But it's not Jesus Christ, it's the Antichrist, and he wants to talk to that daughter. So your own family will, unfortunately, and you're not to hate them for that, it is written and it is just the love of the family to try to save you because they're deceived. But the, it is, serves a good purpose in that you are delivered up. You're not to premeditate what you'll say beforehand. But whatever it is the Holy Spirit speaks, he'll do it. You don't have to. Okay, uh, John from Connecticut. Who and where are there who rebelled in the first earth age and followed Satan? Or are they alive today and among us? Do Did... We rebel, and is that why we are living in the earth age for another chance? Well, that, that's basically the reason. But I, he saved, I feel, the third that followed Satan literally, as it is written in Revelation chapter 12. This is why it said the first shall be last and the last shall be first. I feel that God, in this generation of the fig tree, brought Fourth, that third of the people that followed Satan, born innocent of woman. Because things are different. If you had lived as long as I have, and you've seen the change in people, in attitudes, and in the people themselves, then we have we have people that um, they they kind of go against the word of God, and certainly. I think that God, in all fairness, wants them here when the false Christ appears to see if they'll do it again. And if they do it again, then they're kind of on shaky ground, but then we have the millennium. Stacy from Ohio. What does God, why does God answer some prayers, but not all of them? Because he wants what's best for you. You know, God knows and has a plan and a destiny for his election. And he's not going to give somebody something that will hurt them or cause them harm or would steer or deviate them away from the course that God wishes them to take. You see, he knows what tomorrow brings and the day after that and so forth. We, don't, we know to a degree because we've read the Word. But the fact is, God knows what we need to do his work and to accomplish what we need to do to be able to follow him and to do his work. And he answers prayers accordingly. Uh, Karen from Ohio, when you die, should you be cremated or not? Because it does say how you enter this earth is how you should leave this earth. Thank you. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3, what does it say? Though I have, though I, I give my body to be burned, cremated, and, and yet, I, yet I have not charity, I'm nothing. In other words, if you don't love God, 
It doesn't matter what happens to these flesh bodies. There's nothing wrong with cremation. As it is written in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, these flesh bodies go back to dirt. That's where they came from. Everything that you partake of was growing from the dirt. Okay. Whether it, well, well I, I'm a meat eater. Well, who, do you think the, the cattle that you're partaking of didn't develop from the grass that came from the earth? You're of the earth, and back to the earth you're going. But our spiritual body instantly returns to the Father that gave it. Faith from Michigan. If Christ was here 6,000 years ago, what was the date uh, that before Christ B.C. ended and after Christ A.D. started? Sincerely, faith age 10. I, I love it when children study the Father's Word. Um, faith, Christ was here 6,000 years ago. Yes, he was. He was with God when the Spirit moved upon the waters. But to literally walk the earth in flesh, that did not happen until about 2,000 years ago. And 2,000 years ago, plus 11, is uh, basic, roughly when we went from before Christ to an, Anadomine, which is to say A.D., and, um, which is to say in the Latin tongue, the year of our Lord. The year of our Lord means the year after he was born and walked the earth. About a little over 2,000 years ago, Booker from Illinois, please explain 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 14, 2. Do not speak an unknown t language. The word is tongue, but it means language. <clears throat> to a group of people, God and the angels will know what you're saying because they understand all languages. But the people you're talking to, if it's unknown to them, they're not going to know when to say amen or anything else. In other words, you, you'd be wasting your time. So you, you need, if you, if you don't have their language, you should take an interpreter. That's what he's talking about. Judy from Virginia. What do you mean second advent? Well, the first advent, Christ was, came. He was born of a, uh, as a babe. And he was crucified. The second advent, he's coming back. And he's coming as king of kings and lord of lords, not to be crucified, but to rule and reign forever. Um, and so it is. Zechariah chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, give you both advents. 9 is the first advent, 10 is the second advent. Uh, Jamie from Virginia should women be on the pulpit preaching? Well, it's according to, you know, whether God calls them or not. Right? Because in, what does it say in Acts chapter 2? It says in the generation of the parable of the fig tree, that's it's now, both sons and daughters shall prophesy. And old men will even dream dreams, and God will speak to them. So it means both male and female. So... I'm not going to go against God's word. And as you've heard me explain many times from the Greek, the word is that a woman should not chatter in church. It doesn't mean speak. Chatter, that means to ramble. A man shouldn't either. And so it is. God uses whomever he chooses. Okay, Gloria from Florida. Pastor Murray, uh, how have a... Thank you. Do you have material on how to react when the Antichrist is here? I want to make sure that I do the right thing. When do you, when you do with, what do you do with your money in the bank? And I have a little uh, silver. How do I use this? I heard you say something about uh, barter, but I forgot. Help me. Well, you, you have a little precious metal, and you can barter with somebody that receives the mark and have them buy you a loaf of bread or uh, a pound of this, that, or the other. That's called bartering. We, we in this nation, we had our start bartering, trading goods instead of have, paying for goods. So the, 
But the, the Mark chapter 13 lets you know exactly what you should do. You should not say anything, not even premeditate, but allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you when you're delivered up. So read Mark 13 again real carefully. Maine from, Maine, Maine from Pennsylvania. Can you clarify when Jesus died and what day he was buried on and what day he rose on? I was taught he died on Friday and rose on Sunday. That really wouldn't be three and a half days, would it? Uh, <clears throat> he was crucified on a Wednesday. The new day during that time started at sunset. So Wednesday he was crucified, but he was taken down from the cross and put in the tomb before sunset, which began that day, was Thursday. So he was in that tomb Wednesday night all through Thursday to sunset, which meant that was one full day. And then at sunset, Thursday began Friday, full day, sunset, uh, Friday to Saturday, sunset, three days. And sometimes in the night, he resurrected. Your companion Bible gives you almost a minute-by-minute minute account of this. Uh, so uh, that is the full truth, and uh, that is how it transpired. And so it is. Jimmy from Pennsylvania, Pastor Murray, 1 Corinthians 15, 29, appears to say people can be baptized for the dead. I even read a translation that said on behalf of the dead. I know people who are teaching this doctrine. Could you explain this verse and wording? We, we love you and thanks. Well, we return that love. You know, the whole subject of the 15th chapter up to that particular verse, uh, 29, has to do whether or not you believe Christ rose from the dead. And the proper translation is, why would you be baptized in Christ's name if he didn't, had not risen from the dead? Why would you want to be baptized in a dead man's name? That's, that's what it's saying. It has nothing to do with the actual baptism, baptism of a dead person or their soul. It has to do with whether you believe Christ resurrected from the dead and is living. That's what the whole point is about. And then it meticulously, in the 35th verse, begins to tell you, don't you know that the body, Christ's resurrection, is like a seed planted. A seed's got to be planted and die before it can spring out into a new plant, and, and that, don't you realize that we have two bodies? We have a, a flesh body and we have a spiritual body. And, and you're not supposed to be ignorant of those facts. And then he makes it very clear in the 52nd verse that um, he'll make it clear in the 50th verse that flesh and blood can't enter heaven, so you've got to make a change before you can go there. Well, why is that? It's a different dimension. So in the 50th verse, then in 51 and 2, instantly in the twinkle of an eye, do not be ignorant of that, Paul says, we are changed into that spiritual body from the flesh body. So that's what it's talking about. Why would you be baptized? If you did not believe Christ rose from the dead, why would you want to be baptized in his name? That's all it means. Um, it doesn't hurt to pray for some loved one that's passed on, but, um, uh, and I'll let it go at that. Lance from Georgia, how can I be more diligent? Well, it's real simple. Study God's Word. And, and uh, be diligent with it. Be awake. Have eyes to see and ears to hear. And rightly dividing the Word, what does that mean? It means, who is it written to? How does it apply to you today? And what age necessarily was it, apply, was it concerning? And what is its historical and, and futurist meaning? I don't want that to sound complicated. It's really quite simple. It means rightly divide the word as it should apply to you. 
and be very diligent in bringing that forth. That's how you gain in that. Self-confidence goes right along with it. Christina from Florida. How do you call the period, what do you call the period of time when God's people are called to meet them in the air? Well, it's the seventh trump. It's the first day of the millennium. That's what the time is. It's very plain. Um, it, uh, I just mentioned that time in 1 Corinthians 15, 52. It happens in an instant, just like that. And what it is, it isn't, if you're referring to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17 and 18, the word air doesn't mean atmosphere, doesn't mean sky. It's aion in the Greek tongue, and it means breath of life, meaning your spiritual body. That is breath, or uh, spirit in the Hebrew is ruach, or in Greek, it is pneuma, uh, which um, means um, that your spiritual body steps forward at that time. That's what it has reference to, okay? What do I call it? I call it the second advent, the seventh trump. First day of the millennium. Sandri, Sandra from... I do not know where Sandra is from. If you are in the military and you kill an enemy, is that lying in wait, is that against God? Absolutely not. If you're protecting a free nation of Christians that's, and, and um, people that love God um, within their faith, that love this free nation, uh, and it's been that way from the beginning of time. If you, let, let's take today's lecture, Yedaliah. Boy, he didn't defend himself. Well, what happened to him? They killed him. So, well, what can you do about that? You fight. You have to be wiser than the serpent. And uh, the soldier's prayer, being an old combat Marine myself, uh, I, I feel real comfortable with protecting this nation and having protected this nation. Psalms 144 stipulates, God, give me the power to, over, to, dis, to overcome my enemy, strengthen my arm to do him in. That's, that's, that's a soldier's prayer. Uh, God bless our military that protect this nation, that gives us the right freedom of religion that I can teach God's word to go around the world. It's worth fighting for. Jerry from Minnesota. Please explain Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. When you marry, you are to leave your father and your mother, and the two of you become one flesh. Why? In offspring. When you look at that child, you're, it is one, that is the two in one flesh that, that make up the DNA that creates that entity. Okay, Stephen from Washington. My question is, where did the tribes of Jacob's family end up in modern society? What countries? Well, well Jacob is the name of all 12 tribes. That's the natural seed. Not the house of Israel, the house of Judah. When God uses the name Jacob, he's talking about all 12 tribes. And they ended up in many places of the world. All 12 of them did. Um, you know, there are little things that, if you're alert and you catch, what, what is it that, uh, what do the Dutch sing? Reuben, Reuben, I've been thinking, why did they call the Dutch Reuben? Well, let me guess, okay? Little, little, little things in folklore that comes down through history identifies many people, okay? And, um, it makes a very interesting study, but they are scattered all over the world, but a lot of them, the house of Israel, right in this great nation, and um, how precious it is. Andre from uh, Georgia, how do I explain the pe to people that Adam was not the first man on earth? Well, you're not going to be able to explain it to everyone, but you should be familiar enough with the first six chapters of Genesis 
The Hebrew makes it very simple. And if, if Audrey, if you want to be a teacher, get my work on the first six chapters in video because I use the video to teach you how to read the Hebrew documenting that all the races were created on the sixth day and then on the eighth day God created Eth Adam, a different man through which Christ would come. It's in the Hebrew manuscripts. Sandra from Texas, where can I find the scripture to show that Lucifer was an angel in heaven? He was a cherubim, okay? Documented in Ezekiel chapter 28 that God even called him a cherub. He said, in the day that I created, the cher cher cherubim in the day that I created you. Uh, he's called the king of Tyrus there. Because, uh, Tyrus means rock. Their rock is not our rock. Our rock is Christ. Tyrus, Satan, is their rock. He was one of the cherubim that protected the mercy seat. Uh, he, he was a good old boy up to that point. He earned that right. And then he became prideful and wanted that seat for himself. And as it is written in Ezekiel chapter 28, he was turned to ashes. He will be turned to ashes from within. He was sentenced to death. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying Father's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. Hey, when you study his letter that he has sent to you, telling you how to follow him, to please him, to love him, it makes his day. And when you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. Uh, you can count on it. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, son of the living God and our Savior, he is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645. 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. Genesis 1.46, the first six chapters in God's Word. The world it was. Did you realize there was a world age before this one? Same old world, different age. The creation itself. When were the races created? You see, all the races were created separately, and you'll find that documented in these particular tapes. How was the, what, how and what was the sin in the garden? It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar, for if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you've always wondered about. Genesis 146. Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series.
From Gravit, Arkansas, this is Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book by book, chapter by chapter, line by line, study in God's Word. Now, here's Pastor Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Hey, welcome to this family Bible study. We're going to finish up the second part of War and Armor today. We pretty well covered the armor in the last lecture and touched on the war. Now we're going to go into the war. Primarily, Paul told us in Ephesians 6, hey, we're not going to fight against flesh and blood, the power of the arm.